Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Thursday morning trading room. And uh, we've got a kind of a quiet start to a little bit of a choppy day yesterday. The FOMC uh, release did not do as much for the market as I thought normally when the minutes come out which would have been around 11 a.m. Pacific time. You see the market either make a huge rally or a huge decline, but overall it was just rather blah. Overall, the trend up on the day, but it was, it was tough slogging yesterday. We'll see, hopefully today will be a little Better. I know there's a few reports out today as well. We'll see whether or not they have any impact on the marketplace. Actually, just checking the Reports calendar, we've got about an hour before some more of those FOMC speeches are made. In the meantime, well, I guess we'll just wait and see what we get. We did open with a slight gap lower. The Eagle giving us our first in sync signal of the day. Oh, if, I'm sorry, I forgot to introduce the, the markets uh, to you here. I'm watching the NASDAQ on this particular monitor. It's one of my favorite markets. I'm also watching the Euro dollar and crude oil. But I would be happy to pull up any market that is of interest to you. If there's something you'd like to see, please don't be shy. I was going to point out the first in sync eagle signal, which tends to have a pretty good probability of success. Here's the first in sync signal today. Here was our first in sync signal yesterday, and you did take a little bit of heat on the trade, but overall it worked out pretty well. Um, the day before, the first signal actually did not work out. That's rare. You would have got a swing trade out of that, but I don't think that was enough to get to your high probability eagle target. Good thing we've got the bid and ask display because when the market's moving this slowly, I'm always checking my internet connection, making sure my connection didn't get dropped. A first micro macro cross now here on the Hawk. What time is it? Oh, we're only five minutes into the session. Well, it's up to you. It's a high probability signal. It should at least get up there to find our scalp objective, which is right there. A 
can also use the second push entry strategy and all that means is we allow the signal to engage and then flinch and once we know uh, where the market's reacting we can use that level to enter above so looking for some renewed momentum if we don't get the momentum then we won't get into that trade uh, the rafter not really offering anything here at the moment trying to work a very very early cloud crossover so the clouds dipped ever so slightly bearish here now they've turned bullish again And now they're coming back down. So I'm going to scrub my first micro macro cross trade here for the moment. It's very likely going to be a lot more sideways trading, I would guess, for this first hour. So the hawk now introducing yellow bars, that kind of spoils the signal. with you Steve Steve says oh please let's have some nice trades the next couple of days the most the two most difficult things in trading number one determining the trend number two waiting you know if you're especially if you're a small account trader you may have to sit there for an hour or two or maybe even three before you get something tradable The reason, or one of the reasons, not the reason, but one of the reasons uh, so many people lose money trading is overtrading. And typically they overtrade because they're bored. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's hard to believe, and I know you're sitting there saying, no, that's not me, Eric. Yep, <laughs> it is. It's all of us. We're all guilty of it. I've done it myself. You have to remember your objective is to make money. If you're bored, read a book. Play your harmonica. Do whatever. 
but don't risk your money on a less than ideal trade. People have, uh, we've received more requests for a live trade room. And if that's something that you would like to see, then by all means, email Adam and let him know. The, the current room structure is I you know I try to show you good trades but it's also an education room so as you notice from time to time I'll go off on my little tangents explaining things but I often wonder in a trade room if people would get frustrated with me <laughs> if I don't do anything for an hour or hour and a half. That's a, another issue with trading publicly, of course, is I can do it from the comfort of my office and there's no one there to judge me or criticize me, but in a, in a trading room, especially in a live trading room, people will say, come on, I'm here to trade, let's trade. Yeah, that's not trading. Not if you're looking to make money anyway. Scott says, good morning, Eric. Well, good morning, Scott. Scott says, I went to scroll back a few days, and when I went to turn on the global scrolling, it did not work with the Raptor. Any setting I should look at? Okay, so the global scrolling is not really a feature I use very much because it, gets, it confuses me. Uh, where is it? It's up here somewhere. Shoot, it's been so long since I used it, I don't even remember where it's at. That's the zoom. Uh, is it in the data? Huh. Oh, yes. Okay, thanks. <laughs> Scott says it's in the properties window. Okay. What the global scrolling does, if I if I could find the uh, the feature to turn it on, is it will coordinate your mouse, your cursor across all screens. So it, it's great for back testing. So for instance, if you wanted to see what this signal here looked like on the Raptor and the Hawk, the global scrolling would move all your charts to this particular signal. Um, I think your charts do have to be linked for that to happen. Oh yeah, Mark says change to the global cursor, that's what it is. Um, but I do believe your charts need to be linked. So you're going to click on this little L and you're going to assign all the charts the same color. And then they'll all move together. I use the shortcuts all the time so I forget even how to use the the global cursor. 
Uh, it's probably control G. Uh, no, not yet. Oh, yes, it is. Yeah. So you see what's happening? I've linked now my cursor across my hawk and my falcon. And so if I wanted to see what this signal right here looked like, that's the corresponding signal on the falcon. See, if you look at the falcon chart, you see the cursor is also moving. So you click on the chart, control G, and now all your charts that are linked together will show you the same information. So let's say you wanted to see this number three signal on the Raptor. What did it look like on the Falcon and the Hawk? Well, there you go. You can see it's right there. Yeah, that's um, that's actually a good idea, Scott. I never thought to do that. Yeah, I, I'm with you. Mark says personally, I don't like it because it makes me dizzy. <laughs> that's why I stopped using it as well. But um, you know, if you're using it like. I think Scott's trying to use it where you're comparing signals. Yeah, that's that's sort of interesting. All right, well, I imagine we're moving back into a sideways trading range of sorts. Testing the bottom end here. Scott says, I'm full of good ideas, none of which make me a better trader. Well, the good news, folks, you don't have to be smart to make money trading. In fact, there is evidence to the contrary that smart people are actually at a disadvantage. Wow, Mark's got a nice rig. Mark says, I use six 24-inch monitors, and that's just too much movement going on for me. Yes, I agree. That would be <laughs> a lot of price activity. Well, I'm just going to sit here and wait. Uh, the hawk into yellow bars, the falcon changing direction again. So you can see the trend line starting to look a little bit like a roller coaster. Uh, we did get a, a signal here on the Raptor, but you know, given the state of the market the last couple of days, Second push entries are probably advisable. I think we're going to see a fair amount of false breaks, fake breaks. So I'm just going to wait. Uh, if anybody has a question, please ask. <laughs> Otherwise, I'm not ignoring you. I'm here. There's just nothing going on.
Frank says, how do I turn the global cross off on the charts? Um, I, I'm, again, I'm so used to using the shortcuts, I forget where to find it. Um, oh, right here. Duh. On the pointer. So you could, the pointer is control R, control Q for the crosshairs. And then there's the global crosshair. Well, they're trying to rally. We're going to get another first micro macro cross up, but I don't know. Might be an easier signal to try to short, actually, to fade the signals, not thinking uh, about seeing too much follow through just yet. So you can see the raptor flip-flopping on the signals. A sell signal here, a buy signal here, just no follow-through. This is a good time to catch up on your reading. You know, 
sometimes, like I say, the hardest thing to do is, is not trade. <laughs> I like it. Um, I don't know who said it first, but hope is not a trading strategy. <laughs> you do not want to be the guy or girl that gets into a trade and then hopes the market will go your way. It's actually something that's uh, that's difficult for traders of of all calibers. You know, not just the newbie trader. It plagues it plagues all traders. So what's happening now is we've got a little bit of a sideways range going on, kind of bracketing the morning highs and lows, and the market keeps probing. So it tests the top end of the range, it tests the bottom end of the range. If you were so inclined, you could probably try to short when the market gets up here and you could try to buy when the market gets down here. Uh, I would probably recommend you just look at a scalp target. Just try to grab $50 out of the trade. And there's nothing going on so allow me to demonstrate so I'll put in a limit and we'll look to buy, say I'll buy 60, 70. This is a little arbitrary when you do it this way. And let's say I'm prepared to, well, I'm not going to do two. Let's do one and we're going to buy 60, 70 and I'm going to risk five five ticks. I'm going to risk a hundred bucks, five points. This is sometimes where the day ranger comes in useful. So you can say, all right, the average range, it looks like it's contracting. We're down to 120 ticks on the day. I'm going to allow, um, say, 15% of that as a stop loss. So I'm going to allow about a 20 tick stop loss. which is what I've done. Oh, market flinching a little early. We're actually getting a little volatility in here now. What's going on? This is so unlike the NASDAQ. So we can do the same thing at the top end as well. And I said I was going to go for a scalp target. So we'll look to short the high and I'll give it five ticks to start. trend here. This is the, the difficulty with uh,
trading ranges, right? There's going to be the breakout. You're banking that the breakout is going to fail. And at least 75% of all breakouts do fail. The vast majority of breakouts fail. So it's not a bad bet, but that's kind of what it is. It is a bet. And I suppose at this point, I can bring my stops in above the high. Because if the market reverses at this point and trades higher, well, it's probably going to establish a trend. Get down there. Come on. There we go. That is how you trade a trading range. And it's, I don't know, I find it very nerve-wracking myself. I much rather hold out for a trend to develop and then try to trade the trend. Or the counter trend, whatever the case may be. But you'll see well, the, this move here was a little bit more substantial, but most times, really, all you can bank on is like a scalp profit. Or, I don't know, I got enough gray hair on my head. <laughs> I don't need to try to uh, squeeze a little bit more out of those kinds of trades. Um, Ben's asking, hi, I'm visiting the room. I can't remember what the round dots represent and do the little triangles represent the tempor temporary direction of the trend? Uh, yes and no. The round dots are the warning dots. They're the pre-signal. They're telling us the signal is developing. The triangle and hash mark tells us that the signal is complete. So we've got the warning dot, and then once the signal is complete, in this case, a first micro macro cross on the hawk, that tells us we have a trading opportunity. I guess it also tells us what direction the signal is printing in to avoid confusion. We got a real mess going on here this morning. My goodness, they just keep bouncing back and forth. Um, yeah, of course, uh, Ben's asking, can you repeat that, please? Each of the tools have the same signal prompts. 
pardon me. When we get a signal beginning to develop, we're going to, uh, here I'll show you on the hawk, it's a little clearer on the hawk. When we get a signal starting to develop, we're going to print a warning dot and get an audio alert. When the signal parameters have all been met, the system will print a triangle and a hash mark. That tells us that th the whole signal is ready to go, that we have a tradable signal. Now, just because it's a tradable signal does not mean that it necessarily falls into the high probability category. And if you need uh, the cheat sheets, you can just uh, let me know. Um, I haven't done a cheat sheet for the Raptor because we have the signal prompts now, but if you're wondering what the cheat sheets look like for those of you saying, what's he talking about? Um, where did I put them? There it is. So for instance, with the Hawk, here is the, the Hawk cheat sheet. These would be the five high probability signals that we would be looking for. So the first micro macro cross, the macro pullback, the four arrow consolidation, the post consolidation signal, and then of course the red bar buy, green bar sell. You'll notice that there are other signals that print along the way and that these signals tend to meet their profit objectives. However, if you're looking for a high probability setup, these five are going to be your best bet. So just because we're getting a warning dot printing here and the alert saying that, okay, we've got a possible scalp trade building, if the market rallies and trades here to the high at 61, eight, pardon me, 60, 81 half, which is the top of the logic counter, which is where this bar will finish, it will also print a triangle and a hash mark saying, okay, you, you've got a tradable signal there. However, at least here on the Hawk, it's a signal that's printing on a yellow bar. So it's not a signal that I would classify as a high probability signal. Can you take it? Of course you can take it. it. It's your money. You can do what you want. Is it a high probability signal? Is it likely to reach its profit objective? That I can't tell you. If it were, say, a first micro macro cross or a macro pullback, or here it was flashing for a moment, it was trying to become a red bar buy, similar to this one here then that would be something that we could trade. We could say, aha, that's a high probability setup. Let me see what I can do with that. And here on the, we have high probability setups for the Falcon and for the Eagle. And with the Raptor, we went one step further and we put the signal prompts on them to help you identify the high probability setups. But as I mentioned before, you cannot trade these in a vacuum. You know, I, I see all the time people send me a screenshot of their, char, uh, their, uh, their chart and, and it looks like this. And they say, hey, Eric, I took this signal down here. Why didn't it work out? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> There's no context to your chart. So even though you have a high probability signal, you're flashing a number one signal and you're saying, aha, the Raptor says I have a cloud crossover signal. I should sell that. Well, yes and no. You still need to take the whole context into consideration. Right? Look, look at the context here. The market is moving sideways. Does that mean this number one signal is 
going to work out or not work out? Well, it will work out, but you probably have to run a huge stop, probably above yesterday's highs. Uh, will this number one signal work out? Uh, it might. And now, when I say does a trade work out, I mean it's going to hit its high probability profit objective. So for this signal here, in order to get the trade to hit its high probability profit target, I probably need to risk it above yesterday's highs. So it may take all day for the market to drift or maybe even two days to get down here to 60, 63 half, which would be my profit objective. But that does not invalidate the signal. It just means these are the parameters I would need to make the signal work. Do I want to take a trade in this kind of context? No, probably not. Likewise for this number one signal up here. Well, that people always, asking, Stephanie used to be big at this. She'd say, oh, that signal, oh, that signal failed. That signal's no good. I would, how can you say that? Well, the market moved a couple of ticks against it. No, <laughs> your signal success or failure is based entirely on your stop. If your stop doesn't get hit before the market hits your profit objective, it's a successful trade, is it not? So it's always this balancing act that we're doing. This We're walking this tightrope. But that's why I say when you get a signal, you cannot trade it just blindly. You have to take it within the context of what's going on. And right now the context says we've got a dull market, we've got a sideways market, and there's just nothing to do with it. Much better to allow it to get outside the trading range, show that it can stay out, and then, all right, we'll take, we'll take a risk. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Stephen says it didn't work out because hope is not a strategy. No, I know. Yeah, Steve says I haven't made a, a trade this week, and that's just the kind of week it's been. Again, you know, I've I've mentioned this many times before, but in trading. Trading is not like anything else. You're not production oriented when you're a trader. Yes, you're profit oriented, but not production oriented. You need to make money for sure, but you can make more money in 15 minutes than some people will make all day. If you, you know, if you do it right. Well, Floyd says the mid cap just made a move. Um, and Francisco mentioned crude oil. Here's crude oil trying to drift a little bit lower the crude oil chart a little bit cleaner right there's it's still kind of sideways but not as sideways this is this is the kind of thing we're looking for right this is what's going to happen this is the Nasdaq right now look at all the signals same thing happened to crude oil here a few days ago through the overnight session look at this back and forth back and forth no follow through, just a dull sideways market. And again, the context. 
And then what happens? Oh, the market starts developing what appears to be a trend. Now we get our signal prompt. Compare this number one signal with this number one signal. Does this number one signal not look a little more probable? Even if you can't, you know, put words to it, your gut should tell you this is a better signal. We have something resembling a trend. Here, there is nothing resembling a trend. So now we have a market that seems to be making higher lows. We've uh, established um, a signal. We've met all our signal parameters for high probability signal. Now, before I go too far, the only difficult part with this particular signal is where do I cover the trade, right? There's not a lot of structure. At the very least, the last swing is back here. Because it's so deep, however, you may choose the second push entry strategy. And all that means is the signal prints rather than enter right on the hash mark because the hash mark is an arbitrary number. We have to give the programming a value at which to print the hash mark to perform the calculations from. The hash mark always prints one tick above the high of the bar that meets all the signal parameters. So one tick above the high of the signal bar, that's this bar right here. However, that does not mean you actually have to enter on the hash mark. The second push entry simply means we allow the signal to engage. We see where it reacts. Very, very rarely will the signal run away without some sort of reaction. What this allows you is it allows you a tighter stop. So rather than have to risk the trade below a swing here or even below a swing here, you can probably get by running it to the hard edge of the trading band. Because what's going to happen is the signal's not going to bring you in unless there's some renewed momentum. This signal, by the way, is also a number one signal, even though it didn't print. It's just a continuation of the first signal. It doesn't print because the first signal already printed. So you do have the option. You could adjust your signal to take this one. But we'll leave it as is right now. So now we're engaged. We're in the signal. And boom, go up, hit our high probability target. Thank you very much. And that's it. Our trade is done. You want to make more money? You don't do it by scratching your head now and saying, oh, should I take this signal? <laughs> I don't know. It doesn't qualify as a high probability signal. All right, Eric, so how do I make more money? Well, you make more money by trading more contracts. So here's the trade again, the exact same trade. Now. Again, this has got to be an amount you can afford. So this is all going to be relative to your capital. If you don't have a lot of capital now, your objective should be to build your capital through successful trades. Oops, I should, here we go. Let's change this. It's got to be all in, all out. Okay, so here again, the same trade. And boom, now we made $600, right? So that allows us to focus on the high probability opportunities. So when we get this next signal, we're not saying, oh, well, if I trade more, I'll make more money. Mm, no, not necessarily. Chances are pretty good if you trade more, you'll actually make less.
So again, here is a, a number one signal, the cloud crossover. The clouds change their bias. They go from a bullish bias to a bearish bias. You see how they cross? The prices pull back into the cloud. The cloud supports the new direction, spits the prices back out. We produce a signal. All the trade parameters are met. We get the triangle hash mark and warning dot all happen to occur on the same bar, but that doesn't affect the signal. So the warning dot once again tells us we have a trade that is starting to develop. The triangle and the hash mark tells us that we have a complete signal. So here we have a complete signal. And again, this is something that we could enter with a greater degree of confidence and voila, market comes down, hits your high probability target, done, right? Two trades, uh, hit high probability targets in both, $400, thank you very much. See you later. Oh, $400 not enough for you? Okay, well, let's trade two contracts. That would be $800. Three contracts, $1,200. Four contracts, $1,600. So you see how this is done? It's not looking at every single signal and saying, because if you take every single signal, in fact, we've got nothing going on here right now. Oh, Ben had to reboot, so I'll just wait for him a little bit. But if we take every single signal, we're probably not going to do all that well. And to that end, I'll put the profit finder on here. Okay, good. So Ben's back. Uh, what I was what I was just saying, Ben, is that if we take every single signal, we're probably not going to be profitable. We want to be discerning. Not every signal is worth taking. So I'm going to run the profit finder here uh, in a second. There we go. Uh, profit finder, calculate. Okay, so the profit finder, oh, we actually came up with a positive balance. The profit finder took every single arrow that printed on this chart. And voila, we made $150. Uh, that can't be right because there should be more data in there. Uh, October, no, it's October 3rd to October 11th. So it's only over seven days. Uh, that's still not right. I don't have enough signals going on. Oh, it must be, I know what it is. It's my date. I have the... The wrong date parameters here, one second, or the time parameters. I need to adjust this to my local time, and we'll just do it until midnight. We'll do every single signal from the morning session until midnight, and I'm just going to do this really quick to prove a point. Oh, we still turned a profit. <laughs> Sorry for sounding surprised, but usually when you do this, and I must be missing something, there must not be enough arrows printing. Uh, but normally when you do this, you'll get some astronomical number up here, like, uh, and it's almost always negative. But it's good to know that, see, over the week, we would have taken more than just $400 worth of longs. That's why I know it's not count. I'm missing something. But the point I was trying to make is that we're not looking to take every single signal. Rather, we're looking to concentrate on the high probability signals. Oh, I see why, because the Raptor only prints arrows on the high probability signals. Good to know. Oh, 
a lot of time is spent waiting when you're trading. Uh, you're you're very welcome, Ben. And I thank you for the question because I would be bored senseless otherwise. <laughs> we might as well have a little education going on when the markets are like this. No, your questions are always welcome, folks. That's why I'm here to help you understand your trading systems and to help you become proficient with your trading systems. Once the market starts to flow a little bit, I think next week might be a little bit better. This week seems to be a write-off with all the um, FOMC meetings, uh, reports and whatnot coming out. We're just not getting the usual kind of volatility. This is really, really a dull kind of week. And these are the weeks that that test traders you know the the newbie traders are in there following their whatever signal and they're just getting ground up grist for the mill as they say Yeah, like Ben says, um, I've been busy and have waited for a day or days for a good trade. And sometimes that's what it takes. Like I said, once they establish a direction, it'll be a little easier. Um, you know, sometimes when the market's like this, I'll flip over to another chart. But, you know, we're already an hour into the session. Andrew asks, to trade futures, do you think it's imperative that we understand what drives the market, in particular crude oil, and the fact that producers are hedging and have other reasons to trade? No, I do not. I will show you, again, because we've got a lot of time on our hands, uh, something that will kind of give you the inside look kind of behind the scenes. Bear with me here, I gotta find it. There it is. The commitment of trader report. Dun 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 what this does is years ago, the uh, government made the major players in the commodities markets disclose their holdings so that we can actually see which way they are leaning. Now, uh, will this allow me to adjust it? No. It does not always mean um, uh, these are averages. So what we're most interested in is the commercial speculation line. This chart down here just breaks up this chart in a little bit more detail. This is the old 
format. This is the new format. Personally, I find the new format a little misleading. I like the old format a little better. And what you're most interested in uh, would be the uh, commercial speculators. And you can see that right now, the zero line right here, anything above the zero line is long, anything below the zero line is short. So you can see the commercial speculators are heavy on the short side. Um, so that means when they kind of bottom out, that means they've maxed out their their short positions. Uh, okay, so what does that mean? <laughs> that means that um, it, once the commercials are heaviest to the short side, that probably indicates that the market will head lower. Now, this is this is all relative as well. It's a relative scale, which makes it more confusing, also. But if you if you're watching the commitment of trader report, you know what? I bet you one second. Uh, this is all on a weekly chart as well, so you have to take the time frame into consideration. But bear with me here a second. I'm going to load another piece of software. And this will make things a little clearer, I think. All right, one sec. Okay, don't tell Adam. <laughs> no, he doesn't care. Okay, this is um, Gecko's track and trade software. And uh, what I've done here is I've just highlighted the uh, October, or pardon me, the December crude oil contract. That's up here. And this is the weekly. Uh, this is open interest. This is the commercials, the commercial holdings. See, I can put the small speculators on there, and we can put the, the large specs as well. So this is the exact same chart as what we were just looking at uh, at the bar chart website. Bar chart is free. This is a paid service here. Um, but what we're most interested in, uh, what Andrew's question is, is about the commercials. Should we know what the commercials are up to? The commitment of traders report shows you that. But like I said, it's a bit of a relative scale. You see how the bot market bottomed out here on the commercials? Well, that low obviously is much lower than this low. And it's much lower than this low. Here we have the market peaking, right? But it, it's not a peak way up here. The commercials are always net short. See, crude oil never gets above that zero line. Oh, sorry, I lied. They got above the zero line right here, right through here. And look at what happened a few weeks later. The market starts to rally. So when it hits extreme points, the market will react. See, here's another extreme point. The commercials get really, really heavy net short. Really heavy. Uh, does this mean all the commercials are short? No. Some of them have long positions, but the vast majority are net short. So again, what happens about um, two weeks, a month later? Oh, look at that. Prices start to come down. So it's a, like I say, it's a relative scale. Uh, here they were 
uh, again, heavy net short, and uh, prices started to drift a little lower, not a substantial move lower, but you can see they're still favoring the short side. When we get a little bit higher, like let's say crude oil starts to rally and the commercials start buying it up and it gets up into this region here, and I'm looking now at the lower graph. I know this, the way they do this, um, it's hard to highlight sometimes, but if we get back up to these levels here, when the commercials are not as heavy to the short side, we'll probably see crude oil rally. Another, another uh, way that traders like to look at the commitment of trader report is that they'll actually look at what the small traders are doing, the small specs, and do the exact opposite. This, by the way, is not a terrible strategy <laughs> because most small traders are wrong. So here small traders are heavy to the long side. Look at them, just load it up, and what happens? <laughs> right? The market plummets. Here, they're heavy to the short side. What happens? Oh, the market rallies. <laughs> Here, they're heavy to the long side. What happens? The market falls. It's, I'm sorry, I, I don't mean to laugh, but it is laughable. Here, look at how the, the small specs are flip-flopping. They're heavy short, heavy long, heavy short, moderately long, and the market just kind of drifting sideways. So that, there's another way for you to look at it. But that's what I would do, uh, Andrew, is I would take a look at the uh, commitment of traders because the fundamentals, like the crude inventory report and stuff like that, you will never wrap your head. Well, okay, sorry, never is a long time. Um, it's going to take a lot of time and dedication to understand the market fundamentals and how they, the crude inventory report is going to impact them. It's much easier to know the, the stuff on the macro level. For instance, if war breaks out, uh, crude oil prices are likely to rally. And now I, I'm talking about war in the civilized world. There's always war in, you know, among certain parts of the world. But remember a few years back where there was the whole big deal with uh, Russia and the Ukraine and NATO started stepping up and Russia started say, flexing their muscles. What happened to crude oil prices? They took off like a shot. Right, because if there's war, there's going to be more need for crude oil. Um, there's whenever there's political unrest of any kind in the developed world, crude oil prices will rally. Uh, OPEC, if whenever there's an OPEC meeting, crude oil prices will rally. Even when there's an OPEC agreement saying that. You know, everything sounds very bearish. Uh, OPEC is not going to restrict uh, oil supply and it's going to keep oil prices down and this, that, and the other thing. Almost all OPEC agreements fall apart. One of the member nations will need money for whatever and will <laughs> will break the agreement. <sighs> Yes, like Andrew says, we have uh, we have enough unrest with uh, North Korea right now. Well, if it escalates, if it got more serious, um, crude oil prices are likely to rally. So crude, uh, very much a political market. It will be interesting to see in the next few years how crude oil responds 
to the changes in the automotive industry because of course that's where most of the crude oil goes most of it is refined as gasoline or or fuels for the automotive industry and airline industry but um, with more and more cars becoming uh, or with electric cars becoming more commonplace and uh, vehicle efficiency improving year after year and North America, United States and Canada both becoming energy self-sufficient, it really makes you wonder, well, what are we going to use crude oil for? Still used for heating oil, of course, but natural gas is still a lot cheaper than heating oil. So I think you're going to see more and more places adopt natural gas as a heat source. So yeah, it'll be interesting. I don't know. It may be a long time before we see crude oil rally to a hundred dollars a barrel again. It used to be crude oil is also a very range bound uh, market. It used to be, oh shoot, you know what? I can show you this better on the gecko chart. One second. Of course, I turned it off. Yeah, and like Andrew says, yes, once China goes electric, because of course um, the Chinese are a huge consumer of crude. Um, yeah, Paul says, what are you going to do for electricity? I suppose, uh, I think Paul's question there is aimed at using crude to generate electricity, which it very well might. They may well do that. Okay, so here now is the yearly crude oil chart. And it used to be that crude oil, oops, sorry. Crude oil used to trade within this 85 to 105 range. It was very, very predictable. Crude got down to 80, 85 dollars, you would buy. Crude got up to 105, 110, you would sell. And back and forth it would go. People always used to wonder, hey Eric, how, how do you trade crude oil so well? Well, <laughs> if it hits 85 dollars, I look to buy. If it hits 100, 105, I look to sell. And that's just the way it waffles, or did. Now, we are in an entirely different trading range but it still seems to do the same kind of thing. We got really low here a few months back or a few years back, pardon me, but for the most part, crude oil, it, if it hits the mid 30s to the low 40s, it rallies. Once it gets up to the high mid 50s, it comes back down. Now that's a much tighter range than the range we experienced before, but it is still a range bound market. And it has been for a long, long time. If I scroll this back, well, with the exception of the spike up here to 120, you'll see that crude oil always, or almost always, in a trading range. Where's my highlighter? Right, so prices come down. This range is a little big. Let me adjust that. So prices trade to the bottom end of the range, you buy. The trade to the top end, you sell. Bottom end, you buy. Top end, you sell. And then I forget exactly what happened. This may have been the uh, the Ukraine crisis, but all of a sudden, boom! Up goes crude oil to $150 a barrel. And uh, what annoys me, and I'm sure it annoys you, is here we are 
10 years later, crude oil is a third of what it was 10 years ago, and yet prices at the pumps are higher. Yeah. Don't get me going. <laughs> Don't get me started on that. Oh, but we had to remodel the refinery. Yeah, I think it was more like your yacht needed an overhaul. Yeah, exactly. Like Andrew says, what's bad is the fact petroleum prices are as high as they were when crude oil was over 100 bucks. I know, it makes no sense whatsoever. But that's the luxury of having a monopoly, isn't it? You can do as you please and nobody can stop you. <laughs> yeah. Steve says, don't bash the yacht remodel. You know, we all know it costs money to run refineries. It costs money to have competent employees. But for crying out loud, these refineries have been bought and sold, bought and paid for so many times over. It's just a cash grab now. They're, we're getting raped and there's nothing we can do about it. Hey, way to go, Mark. Mark says, I took that late filter entry signal here on the Falcon. That's the one here. The filter goes out of sync, comes back into sync. Trend line never changes color. You produce a signal. That's a high probability signal on the Falcon. And uh, Mark says, cashed out $300 on three cars. All in, all out, seems like it's taking a long time this week to make money. But I'm up over 900 on the week at least. Well, well done, Mark. Um, Andrew says, so who's buying it? Because we all want cheaper fuel. Uh, well, the cost of fuel has absolutely nothing to do with the cost of crude oil, as you can see. The cost of fuel is regulated also by supply and demand and by the how much the oil companies decide to refine. If they restrict the refining or the uh, as is was the case with the uh, hurricane blowing through the Gulf of Mexico and wiping out Houston and, and whatnot. They had to close a couple of refineries while the storm passed. And uh, that, of course, restricted production. But that's how they control the cost of fuel is they just reduce how much fuel they produce. And really, you know, I remember way back many, many years ago, in one of my university classes, I was taking a cost accounting course. And um, the accountant or our professor had us figure out the production cost of the widget. And so we're all working away like busy little beavers on our calculators, figuring in our direct costs and indirect costs of depreciation. And then the professor asked, all right, what are, what are you going to sell this for? What is your retail price? And so we're all working away, figuring out markups and everything. And we all came up with a different answer. And you know what the professor said? He says, you're all wrong. You sell it for whatever you can get for it. And isn't that always the way? 
the C, the music industry is a perfect example. CD is now non-existent anymore, but not that long ago, people would routinely shell out 20, 25 bucks for a music CD. And yet that CD cost less than a penny to produce, including the jewel case. Of course, the information that was on the CD is what you were paying for, but even uh, artist royalties and all that only amount to a couple of dollars. Everything else was just profit for the record companies. And it's like that, you know, with everything. <laughs> yeah, Andrew says, bring back the vinyl. It's making a big a bit of a comeback, too. One day I'm going to go through my dad's basement. I've got playing cards in there, uh, like baseball cards, trading cards, hockey cards, old records. I don't know if, <laughs> what kind of condition they're in, but there's some pretty old stuff down there. All right, so they're going to make a push here to the downside now, which is typical because we've traded above the overnight highs. See, there's the overnight high, poked above it, and of course now, you know, the breakouts do have a tendency to fail, so they're trying to head a little bit lower. Paul says, consider the cost versus the selling price of the Raptor. Well, the cost, I can tell you, there was a lot of um, a lot of man hours. Uh, obviously, the the production cost is nothing physical; it's a piece of software. But the uh, the R and D hours, they were substantial. The DTS system, the predecessor to the Raptor, took nine months to develop. So, yeah, there, there are some indirect costs associated with that, for sure. Well, gang, we're kind of drifting here, so... I think we might button up shop here for the morning. We'll try it again tomorrow. If you're going to hang out the rest of the day, uh, I think we're going to see more, more of the same. I think we're going to see uh, the market try to retrace. So if you're looking at a possible signal, I may be more inclined to short, look for a little bit of an uptick, a failure, and look for a possible sell signal to develop. Again, I would not hang on too long. Get your scalp profit or your swing profit and get out because somebody's going to beat you, beat you to the exit. Oh, yes, right, right, right. Um, Floyd and Andrew both reminding me crude inventory out here in a couple of minutes. We'll see what what happens with that. It's... Um, I don't know. Normally, I like to bracket these types of reports. Maybe what we'll do is We will there we go. We'll set up, we'll enable a stop, we'll let the report release, and then I'll look at placing an order. Maybe we'll bracket it that way.
Uh, Ben's asking, could pivot point type indicator be put into this program? Um, I'm, I'm sure it could. I have to talk uh, or talk. Send an email to Adam with your requests. He's always interested in um, in your feedback. But uh, again, the the overriding principle is: Does it help you make a trading decision? Right. It's. We don't want to go down that rabbit hole where our focus is tweaking the indicator, tweaking the tool, because that is a rabbit hole you will never emerge from, and you don't need that to make money trading. I know traders who make money trading with a trend line and nothing else on their chart, and then I know traders who have all kinds of um, indicators that they're watching and also make money. So it's, like I say, it's a rabbit hole. It's one that catches a lot of attention. A lot of people try to filter out the bad signal. But you know what? The market will always, always toss your indicator another little curveball. But yeah, if pivots are something that help you make a trading decision, then by all means, use them. But if they don't, uh, you don't need them. All right, so there we go. We're getting the spike now. Oh, we're getting a counter trend signal, actually. Okay, so the low end is right here. So I'll bracket, I'll bracket that side. And all I'm doing is I'm allowing the crude inventory report to release. And then I'm going to bracket the range that develops. So I know here's the bottom end of the range. And once I see the top end of the range, I will place my buy order. What do we think? Is that it right there? Is that as high as they're going to go? All right, we'll go with that. Pretty lackluster uh, crude inventory report. What a yawner. But, uh, you know, as I, as I said, folks, if there's something you would like to see, if there's something that we're not doing that you would like to have, or if there's something we're doing that you don't like, um, send an email to Adam. He's the man that makes these kinds of things happen. Well, I'm so glad I waited for that. <laughs> oh, man. What a misfire that crude inventory report was. It didn't catch anybody by surprise. It was exactly what they thought it was going to be. And so now it's business as usual. You could still keep this range bracketed if you chose. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna call it quits today. It's just it's just too quiet for me. I'm gonna go do something else and come back tomorrow. All right, folks. I'll talk to you then. Bye for now.